Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, this is Lois Gray, North Highland College, for the Control and Instrumentation module. Um, is anybody VCing in? Not obviously at the moment. Okay, so I think all the people who are listening remotely, you've already signed a photo consent form. If you haven't, can you make sure you get that to me? Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, email me and I'll send you one. It was on the back of your handbook. Everybody should also have got a handbook, either from myself or from Peter, hopefully. And you should all also have enrolled and selected your modules. If anybody hasn't, who's actually in the class just now, um, we can do that after I've done the sort of two-hour BC bit. Um, I don't have time to help you with stuff like that. Okay, so I want to say in the class, if everyone makes sure they sign the register for me and also fills in a photo consent form, we'll just get started. So this is a module on control and instrumentation. Um, it leads on, in the new degree, we're going to have some more advanced modules which kind of lead it more onto robotics and things. So there is quite a lot of maths in it. Um, it's probably more focused on control than on the instrumentation side. It says maybe about two thirds control and maybe one third instrumentation. Um, and it's very focused on modeling using Simulink. Um, Simulink is a very powerful modeling tool used in industry. Uh, the advantage of modeling, you probably will realize, it's a bit like prototyping, but a lot, a lot cheaper. You can do a mathematical model that can be really representative of your system. And in fact, that's what your coursework's going to be to start with, modeling the flow rig there. And then you can test it in all sort of extreme conditions. You can put extreme inputs into it. You can vary, I don't know, environmental conditions. And basically, you can ensure that uh, the system you've designed is going to tolerate everything that is likely to be thrown at it. So in the young, for the younger guys, they do the systems analysis module unit in the HND. So you, most of you will have done that, because most of you did an HND with me here. Well, that would have been with David Heimer's, that class. And you probably saw the video of the Tacoma Bridge Narrows. Have most people seen that? Uh, well, I haven't got it with me, because I, I normally show it to the HND level. Um, and that shows what can happen if you design a system, and it's great. It's, it was um, hailed as one of the best bridges in America in the time. I think it was around the 1940s. It was one of the longest spans, and they were really proud of their engineering feat in managing to get a good, stable bridge that worked over that distance. But then one day there was a wind strength um, and frequency that they hadn't predicted, and the bridge start, went into a sort of unstable oscillation mode with the wind. And if you haven't seen the video, look it up online. You can see that the whole concrete bridge is oscillating madly in the wind. And eventually, of course, it collapses and it was a big disaster. So with mathematical modelling of systems, um, not so much controllers, I suppose, but a lot of this course is about mathematical modelling. There's only really a wee bit about controllers. With mathematical modelling, you can obviously <coughs> apply inputs like that and predict what's going to happen without having to actually go and build a bridge, which is obviously very expensive without having to go and bridge the build the system, yeah? Okay, so while I'm still on the camera, um, this is probably the only book that you ha actually have to buy for the course. Um, if you can get it from a student who's been here previously, that would be a good idea, because it's quite expensive. Um, I'll pass it round. I don't know if you can really see it, but it's Control Systems Engineering by Norman Neese. Um, so a lot of the self-assessment questions you get on a weekly basis from me are taken from this book. Um, I do provide you with answers, but I think only the first couple of weeks have I provided the questions. Um, after that, I expect you to have the book, um, so the questions will be directly from the book. Um, also, your coursework is quite heavily based on the book. Um, not the first part, but certainly the second part, there's a root locus controller design, and the book has the steps that take you through how to do that. So it's quite used for that as well. Okay, it is quite expensive. I think it's coming up to £100 off, so I don't know. It's a while well since I checked the price of it. There are one or two copies in the library, so if you're quick, you could get a copy from the library. So I'll pass this round, and you can just take a note of the name and author. Although, to be honest, it's on Blackboard anyway, which I'm going to switch over to in a minute and show you your way around. Everything you need to know is on the VLE. People have done modules with me before will know that. It's because I've got remote students. I have I can't give you more information in the class than they already have. So. <coughs> right, so if you've enrolled online and you've picked your modules, you should have access to the VLE page. Um, I'll switch over to the PC view now. 
So hopefully everybody can see that. I'll turn the lights down a wee bit more as well. I think that's quite close to <laughs> the sort of systems you're going to be looking at, um, the book's quite electrically biased, and I apologise for the mechanical people, they do tend to find this unit a bit harder for that reason. Um, it's just because, I suppose, your electrical circuit elements are easier to, to model. Your three electrical circuit elements are your resistor, inductor, and capacitor. And they relate to your mass spring dampers and your mechanical systems. So the sort of systems we're looking at are going to be mechanical and electrical. Um, you can also use this modelling theory, obviously, for hydraulic, pneumatic, electromechanical, mixed systems. Um, every system can be built from a first principles mathematical model and then tested. But we'll concentrate on electrical and mechanical, probably slightly more electrical. Okay, so if you... Um, well, and most of you have been here before. In fact, I think everyone's been here before. So you go to your current students page. I'm not really going to go through an induction because there's an induction video somewhere. Um, and you guys have all done this before anyway. You'd be pleased to know there's no crit real critical analysis in this module. So that's one thing that's a bit easier, but there's a lot of maths. <laughs> anyway, so we're on Blackboard. And if you've logged on properly, uh, sorry, enrolled properly, you should have the module up on your left hand side. I'm in this list here. Can you see that? Okay, I need to zoom in a bit, don't I? Small. Uh, you zoom. Trouble with zooming is I won't be able to find things once I've done that. I think that's a, that's a bit better. Isn't it? Yeah. So your your module will be here. Um, it's this one here, UH609809. You can identify it by the code. <coughs> can't find the numbers and then that just means it's a 20 credit module they used to be a 15 credit module so that's the differentiation switch that on uh, you get a web page bit like that so everything you need to know is here i'll just quickly go through that because i know some of you have done courses with peter but possibly not with me i don't know not degree level anyway so under staff information there's contact details for everybody teaching on this um, the other people haven't put their names up, but there are people doing this in Perth, in Venice. No, not in Venice. Perth, Lewis Castle. It used to be Murray, but they're not doing it now either. So it's Perth and um, Lewis Castle, I think. Under module information, there's quite a lot of useful information there. There's the details of your core book. So this is the one you need to buy. Um, you can try and get it on Amazon. You can get it from Course Smart as well, but I think Amazon probably sell them too, so it won't get cheaper there. Um, there's some recommended books, which I don't say you have to buy. Um, you can get those from the library or try and borrow them from earlier students or whatever. You don't need them right through the course. We only get into them now and again. Um, you need a MATLAB. Now, you can access MATLAB through my UHI. So if you want to do this at home, you will be doing some work at home. Each, hour's two, each module's 200 hours, and I'm only teaching you for four, so I don't know how that works out, how much per week you're meant to do yourself. So I think it works out about eight or ten hours. So you will be doing some of the coursework at home. You can access MATLAB through my UHI. It's a little bit slow to start, so if you click on the link and you wait for 15 minutes and nothing's happening, just be a bit more patient and just wait a wee bit longer. Once it actually is running, it's quite quick. Um, as long as you've got reasonable bandwidth. Failing that, you can buy it as well. Uh, the student version does contain everything you need for this course. Um, so last year, when you guys did electrical power, it didn't have the stuff you needed for electrical power, but it does contain everything you need for this. Um, apart from maybe coursework one, there's a few different ways of doing the coursework, and some of the stuff for one particular method isn't in the student version. Okay. Um, you won't need to buy National Instruments, Lab you. We don't really use that much. We just use that for the first experiment to gather data. There's a lesson plan there. You don't really need to follow that because it's set out in weekly blocks anyway. It's very obvious what you're going to be doing. Um, this stuff, I think that's a link to last year's regulations because when I set the page up, they haven't published this year's ones. Um, and this is general resources about how to study, how to write 
reports, how to do critical analysis. It's a conglomeration of um, English universities produce that website there. So it's got some quite good um, information on it. It's not a UHI site, it's a, a whole heap of universities come together. Some Australian ones as well, they produce quite good stuff. Okay, so I think, I suppose the main page is your learning resources page. Um, I don't use the discussion board at all, so you can ignore that altogether. Um, just email me if you want to ask me anything. Um, divided into two parts, essentially. Um, I'll just turn the edit mode on. Uh, the main part is the control part, which is what we'll start with. Um, the coursework pretty much focuses on that. And then there's an instrumentation part, um, probably for the last four or five weeks. Um, you do have a reading week this year, so I, I suppose you probably know about that. Um, I will actually, if you want me to, I can take a class that week because uh, this is a 12-week course. It's quite tough to cram it into 11 weeks. So there is actually a formal subject for that reading week as well. So if you want me to take a two-hour BC that week, I'd be quite happy to do that and go over that particular subject. Or if you just want to come in and work on the computers yourself or whatever, that's okay as well. I've booked the room for everybody. So we're going to start with the control today. Um, I was going to go over a wee bit of basic maths with you as well, but I think I might go through the slides first, rather than throwing you into maths uh, <laughs> so early in the morning, yeah? Um, okay. So we're talking about um, control systems. So the most common one, what's the most common type of control system? I guess. Hi, Kevin. Oh, you've made it up anyway. Anybody, any ideas what the most type of common control system is? We did a bit about them know. last year. Okay. Sorry? PID? Has everybody heard of PID? Yeah, proportional integral derivative control. Yeah, so that's the ones we'll be mainly looking at. We're going to look at different ways of designing PID systems. But before we can do that, we need to be able to mathematically model the basic system without a controller. So we've got two kinds of systems. We've got open loop systems and we've got closed loop systems. Do you know the difference? Yeah. What's, what's the key difference between an open loop and a closed loop system? Feedback, yeah. So these are easy questions that you can answer, okay? I'll ask you difficult questions later. You need to be scared, because it's a degree class. Uh, what else do I need? Right, so some examples <coughs> of engineering systems. Anyone want to give me an example? Everything's an engineering system. There should be loads of examples you can come up with. Heat. Sorry? Heat. Heat. Did you heat. take? Yeah? Oh, my heat memory. Yeah, Perfect. yeah, right. So temperature control of rooms and things. Yeah, that's an engineering system, and it has a controller. Quite often it'll have feedback as well. Um, things like a toaster, that's a heating system. It doesn't have feedback. Things like an oven, that has feedback. Things like climate control, obviously they have feedback, so they're closed loop as well. We've got all different methods of ways of controlling them. They would generally be proportionally controlled because they've got a very slow time response. Anything that's heating up takes quite a long time to get to temperature and also it takes quite a long time to change. So you generally need to um, use I and D to optimise the response because speed for them. Okay, any other, any other ideas? And you've got things like cars, there's loads of control systems in your cars, yeah. Cruise control is a good example. Um, that would probably be PID, because you want quite fast reactions with that, and you don't want overshoot and things. You don't want your car to be going like that when you're trying to keep it at a constant speed, or when you're trying to accelerate and decelerate. Uh, what else? I don't know, most forms of transport. Electric toothbrushes, sometimes they've got control systems in them now as well. They probably don't have feedback, to be honest, but... Yes, it depends how complicated your toothbrush is. Yeah. You don't seem very engaged, guys. <laughs> Monday morning, first. Monday morning. Yeah. It's not Monday morning, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it's Tuesday morning. Tuesday. <laughs> okay, you just want me to speak. You don't really want me to ask questions. Yeah. As long as you understand what I'm saying. Ask questions <laughs> if you don't understand anything, then. Okay, so I'll show you how the website's laid out. Um, we have... Oh no, that was week one, was it? Yeah, go back to where we were. Yeah, it's laid out on a weekly basis. So learning materials, week by week. 
I'll post the videos in there as well, all the links to the videos. Um, I'll try and put them on YouTube. I'm not strictly allowed to, but I always find people struggle to get into any of the UHI streaming services. So I'll put them on YouTube. How did you get onto the UHI ones? How did you get onto the UHI ones? Yeah. What's your, what's your site you got on? It's UHI Stream, I think. Right. If you type in UHI Stream in Google, you would get the... Uh, Helix site, um, and then you've got to log on with UHI slash username, and then your password. I'll, I'll take a note and I'll send you more information about that if you're interested. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway, weekly, everything you need to know, pretty much. Um, yeah, we do rely quite heavily on the book, so in some cases there might be references to the book rather than actual notes in there. And then we also weekly we have a self-assessment question, so one <coughs> set for control, one set for instrumentation. Again, um, that's the entire solutions for the course from the book. Um, but then you can see quite clearly the sort of self-assessment questions. Sometimes there might be little exercises as well, but mostly it's just questions. Some of them are online. Um, you'll have done multiple choice questions on Blackboard before. Some of them in that format, but the majority of the control ones are out of the book. Uh, what else? Um, I suppose I will go over the coursework today, okay? Because I always feel it's best if you at least have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve in a coursework as early as possible, and then it gives you more chance to, to really get into it. So it's not been... Uh, <coughs> Sorry, it's not been approved by the external examiner yet, but he, it's not that dissimilar to last year's one. So then the course looks to have press source. One, but it's in two parts, yeah. and it's quite a large one, I would say. Okay, so the course works in here. It's draft at the moment, but you can access it. Um, I'll look at that later on when we're doing the lecture, just to quickly show you. Because I do also want to do the experimentation bit today with you um, later on. Um, so you can see two parts to... It's one course work, but it's two parts. Okay, so, so everything is there. You've got no excuses for missing deadlines. Um, in terms of submission of coursework, does everybody use Turnitin? <coughs> Mechanical people use Turnitin as well? Yeah. Okay, so your submission page is um, here. And you will know if you miss deadlines, you get penalised. I can't remember what the current rates are, um, unless you have mitigating circumstances, which you can submit. Um, there's some more information there, but we're not going to too much detail on the coursework today, I think, unless anyone's really keen to start. Are they split up, 30 and 20? Go to it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't actually remember. I wrote it, but I haven't looked at it for a while. I think it might be the first one's worth a lot more than the second one. I think it might be 60, 40 or 70, 30. Depends what browser you're in and what happens. But, uh, so the coursework are worth 50%. You have an exam at the end of the year in either week 13 or 14. The date's not been set yet. Again, if you miss the exam, you have to submit that against circumstances or you'll be marked as failing. You have to release it. That's a bit small, but we're just looking at dates, are we? Oh, sorry. Oh. <coughs> anyway, part A is 30%. And part B is 20. Okay, yeah. Oh, it's a possible 50 total. <clears throat> so they are pretty a bit more even there. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so I have slides every week. Um, I know it's a bit boring me just going through the slides, but it's a good memory jogger for me to make sure I don't miss anything for you. So I'm just going to go and do that just now. Is that all right? <coughs> is there anything else you want to know? Any questions at this stage? No. Is there any books we need to get? Yeah, there's one going around. Um, you missed the beginning, Kevin. There's all the stuff you need to get is under the module information. There's <coughs> books and there's um, recommended books. But you don't need to buy the recommended ones. You can just
Okay, so I'll probably just go through. This is the, the recordings from last year are still on, and I do that so that if a recording doesn't work one week, um, I've still got some information there, because there's remote people who obviously aren't going to be seeing you. We just go by the recordings and nothing else. Um, every week there'll be the PowerPoint, which I'll go through. There's also some additional notes. I'm not sure how much extra information they give you, but some people prefer reading notes to listening to <coughs> a video or watching a PowerPoint. And this week, I think, there's a wee introductory thing that I might run first, actually, here, which is just a basic thing of how PID works. And you might have already seen that last year, I'm not sure. And then there's usually a bit of maths, especially towards the beginning of the course. There's a bit on matrices, which you may or may have. Who's done matrices? Anybody? Did, last year, I... Did you do it last year? No, You've done it as well, haven't yeah, you? Oh, good. Okay. What about you two? When <coughs> you do it, I think, two students? No. So we'll go over that a wee bit as well. <laughs> Um, a bit on mesh ne network analysis, that's more electrical, unfortunately, but it shows you how to use matrices for simultaneous equations. Um, and then there's some external links here, um, links to control tutorials and also links to maths. Um, there's a really good math site in math, I don't know if anybody's used that, that goes through a lot of these subjects in a really quite clear way. It's a third party website, it's not real. Okay, let's just get started. I was going to show you this maybe first. This is quite a good learning object. It doesn't always work in the right browsers, but that's it. Welcome to the activity on PID control. I might just tell you next to the Okay. 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 Okay, so this is a little um, re reusable learning object, I don't know if you've heard of them, <laughs> that produced by Wisconsin University, and they're just really, I think they're quite good. So it's a demonstration of a, a PID control behind a robotic arm. This is the same picture again. There's a guy speaking in the background, but you can see what that arm's doing. It's doing some, I think it's doing some drawing by the look of it. But equally, you could use it for, I suppose, milling or more precise operations as well. Oh, yeah, well, there it goes. I think it's is it welding there or something along that sort of lines. So that's an example of where a control system would need to be very precise, very fast reacting. Um, you know your responses. Your second order responses often have overshoot, something like that. You wouldn't be able to tolerate overshoot on, obviously, because it would weld well, well in the wrong place. Right, so what's happening? Um, this is a description of what's going on. So the machine is com commanded to do something by the computer, and that's obviously a digital signal. So that then goes for a digital to analog converter because the robotic arm works in the analog world, it's not working with the digital. It's able to move to any position. It's not working in little steps. That's what I essentially mean by an analog world. So we need this digital analog converter to convert it to an analog signal. Um, then because the system's got feedback, um, it's a position control system. Okay, so the motor will have moved to a specific place from the last operation. And there'll be feedback via a potentiometer here. It's a quite easy way of doing position feedback. Equally, if it was a rotational system, you could use something like a resolver or an encoder to get your angle feedback, but this is giving you linear position feedback. Um, and that's compared with the demand. So this thing here, it looks very electrical, but it's actually just a comparator. It's just comparing what's the voltage here, what's the voltage here, and it produces a signal at the output that is proportional to the difference in the voltage. So if the arm's not at the right place, um, we're gonna get a signal here, which is called an error, it's not really an error, it's just a difference between where we want the arm to be and where it actually is. Um, that then gets amplified. Um, in this case, just by a proportion, so this would just be proportional gain. Yeah, proportional gain is just like a amplification factor, it's just a gain factor. So say that signal was one volt, it would maybe be five volts here. That's, that's how proportional gain works. And in fact, you can actually implement proportional gain controllers in exactly that way, with a hop amp like that. And then obviously, because the arm is using a motor to rotate it or move it, um, it's going to need a power amplifier to give it more current. So that's the only reason that's there. 
um, that I suppose would be part of your actuator system, that, and your motor would be actuator. And then um, the controller then obviously drives the arm to the right place, and it will keep doing that until the error goes down to zero. Um, is that actually true with a proportional only control? Can you get down to a zero error? No, you can't. What do you need to get to a zero error? You've got choice of proportional integral or derivative. Anybody know? Mm, no? Integral. Integral, good, yeah. So some people are remembering stuff from me. Was that you, Oakley? Yeah. Was it Karen? Yeah. Oh, well done. Right. So the, She's the surprised, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, please just behind yourself. Sure, the control. So, yeah, so you need integral control. You should remember that stuff from your engineering analysis class, although I know it was 50 years ago now. So. Okay, so that's basically how that works. Any questions? Everybody understand? <coughs> yeah, quite straightforward. Is that an open or closed loop system? <laughs> open? It's closed. It's definitely closed. It's got feedback, yeah? Here's the feedback. It even says negative feedback signal. And that brings us to another point. Feedback always has to be negative. Okay? If you have positive feedback, you end up with an unstable system and oscillations. And that's because if you put a positive signal in here, the voltage in here will start to grow instead of decreasing. And the arm will get further and further away from where it's meant to be. It'll have the wrong effect. Feedback always has to be negative for a stable system. If you want an oscillator circuit, great. You can put positive feedback in we don't want oscillator circuits. We want things that have come to a nice, smooth, steady endpoint and don't bounce around at all. Right, it's going to actually run through what that's doing, I think. But, uh, I kept talking there, so something I meant to do here. I'll activate the computer. Okay, so now we're going to ask the arm to go to a different position from where it is just now. So we activate the computer. Um, you don't really need to understand this too much. This will come into more of the instrumentation. But that's the digital code telling it where to go. We get an 8-volt signal. Let's scroll up a wee bit. An 8-volt signal coming out of the digital to analog converter, which is equivalent to this code here. Obviously digital. Um, Oh, three volts. It said eight volts at the top there. But we're getting a three volt command signal here. Oh. So that's it trying to obtain the right position. And when these two are both three volts, which wouldn't really be exactly correct in this proportional only system, um, the arm stops moving. Yeah. You can see that again, but anyone want to see it again? No? Happy with that, yeah. The main reason I'm showing you this is about two years ago, a whole class said, we don't understand anything about control systems. It would have been nice if you'd explained a wee bit about the basics before we dived into the main theory. So I don't know how useful this is, but that's what they want. So, so I do take feedback. There's a, if you want to change anything, do tell me and I will change it. Maybe not for you, but for the next class. So at this point, there's no difference between the two signals. Um, so there's no output here. So obviously the controller is going to stop driving the arm and it's going to sit in that position and not move it at all anymore. Uh, yeah. Okay, now we've got a different command, so it's going to move again. Uh, did that move? Press next. Yeah, so it's moved to the new position. Um, it's giving zero volts out here. Both the feedback system's giving zero volts, so there's no, nothing, no voltage there. I think this is going to show a step change. Ah, I can't remember, it's a while since I've done that. But so it's going to show a step change from zero to a specific position. So you'll see how the output responds. Um, the output being this point here, the, me the measurement output, um, to an input of a sudden change, which is what a step is. Actually, it's not, it's around. Uh -huh. That's wrong there. But that's how it's going. So you can see there is an error still there. <coughs> Um, this is what the output's doing, the screen line, and that's what the input's doing, the red line. Um, I don't need to show that again. But... Um, if I just run that, then it moves um, to the four volts. Yeah. Um, 
that at the end of that thing? I need to do something else. Show what we can't do. Okay, and it's showing it eventually reaching pretty close to the position it was meant to be in. There's not much of an error there. And that's just with proportional control. Um, then we can go on to look at Do the zooming out unless I can't really see what's going on. Okay, so now we've got a demand of eight volts. I think we're going to do something And you adjust the proportional gain. So now, if you adjust the proportional gain, what would you expect to, to happen to the speed of the response? Faster. It will be faster, yeah, because you're getting more voltage. For each little input change, you're getting more of an output voltage. Um, so the whole thing's going to react faster and try and reach the, the set point quicker. Uh, it'll also give more volts out as well um, to drive the motor, obviously. So if I increase the proportion again, and then continue. Okay, so, so the desired operations to respond as quickly as possible, and you can do that by increasing the proportional gain. But the disadvantage of that is the feedback system doesn't react quickly enough <coughs> to stop it in time. So that's when you get your overshoot. Yeah, it takes a little while for the feedback signal to, well, for the, the controller to compare the two signals and stop the arm. So for that reason, you get a bit of overshoot. So, uh, I don't know if it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, it's just showing the game. If it's enough, it's really much. Right, so now we've got a higher, Proportional gain is still only proportional control, but it's a higher proportional gain. That's your input, that's your output. So it was a lot faster, but you can see here it's gone past the position it was meant to be. Um, so everybody should know that that's overshoot, yeah? You've done this before. Yeah, I don't think that's too big a problem. Okay, So, of course, it will correct for the overshoot because now the polarity of the comparator is swapped around. So, the plus signal is bigger than the, sorry, the minus signal is bigger than the plus signal. So, of course, it will try to bring the arm back down again. And eventually, it will settle at a known position or the position we want. Oh, no, it's not. I'm sure a second overshoot will do that first. This way. Mm -hmm. So, you get a signal that looks a bit like that. And um, that's a very characteristic signal for a second-order system. Second-order systems have two storage elements. So in terms of electric circuit, what would be the two storage elements? I told you the components are resistor, capacitor, inductor. Which of those stores energy? Capacitor. Capacitor, capacitor stores energy. What else? Inductor, yeah. So capacitor stores energy in the electrostatic field. Inductor stores energy in the electromagnetic field. Um, in terms of a mechanical system, what are the two storage elements? Spring. Spring is one of them. And? Damper. Damper? I think damper releases energy. The mass. Yeah, the mass stores energy as well. I'm not exactly sure how that works, not being a mechanical person, but those are the two that store energy. And the damper is similar to a resistor. So a resistor is there to remove energy from the system, essentially. You know that you can use a resistor to limit the current in something, so it removes the energy. Um, the damper also removes energy. So if you have a damper on your shock absorbers in your car, it's going to take away the overshoot um, by removing the energy from the system. Okay. So, uh, I think that was the next bit. Okay, we're going to add a derivative control now. Um, derivative control will help to prevent that overshoot. Uh, because derivative control, we're going to go more into control later, but derivative control is proportional to the rate of change. Okay, so as the rate of change gets faster, the derivative control gets bigger and has an effect of um, compensating for the, the overshoot, essentially. So the faster it's changing, the bigger the derivative control output and the closer the thing will get to the final value that it's meant to be. Because it's proportional to the rate of change of the error. Like I say, we will come into this more. Yeah. 
just let me see the effect of that. This bit's not very meaningful. I don't really understand what this is actually showing. It's showing what's actually happening at the comparer, but it's hard to relate that to real life. So I think we'll skip through that quite quickly. Uh, what's that doing? So now we have a constant error. So once you have a constant error, the derivative action stops working because the derivative action is proportional to the rate of change of the error. If the error is constant, there's no derivative action, um, which is shown here. So you had derivative action during that first bit, and then it died. There's no derivative action. And then obviously when you reach closer to the top, you will also see some derivative action at the top. And then you don't get the error. Um, so getting derivative action here, which will prevent the overshoot should prevent the overshoot, I think. Yeah. And then once the error is constant, again, the derivative action goes off. You can run this yourself to read this stuff a bit more slowly if you like. But, um, So now we have a steady state error, which we did actually have with the proportional only control, but it was small. And it will just stay in that condition for forever and ever until it gets another command signal. Right, and then the final one is adding integral amplifier. Um, so an integral amplifier is proportional to the integral of the error. So if the error stays there for a long time, um, Integral is kind of adding over time. I think most people know that if you've done any maths. Um, another way of doing an integral is to split the signal into lots of little bits and add them all together. So the integral is adding the error as time goes on. So if there's an error, as time goes on, the integral controller is going to get a bigger and bigger output because it's proportional to the integral of the error. So the longer the time is, the bigger the drive from the integral amplifier, and eventually the signal settles to no error because as it drives a bigger and bigger output, it will obviously bring the arm closer and closer to the required position. And that's how you actually implement an integral controller, by the way. You can actually, in real life, do these. These are op-amps, and these are the circuits that you use. Uh, but we'll see now, the main effect of an integral control is to remove the error. They're not actually very good for any other characteristic. They cause more overshoot, overshoot and they cause instability. But the key thing is they remove steady state error. Just to define what steady state error is, steady state error is the time when the signal has stopped changing, when the arms stop moving in this case, yeah? That's your steady state. Transient part is the part where everything's still changing at the beginning. Um, if I go into this from here, I'll skip past the bit that shows that. Yeah, so the longer the signal's present, the error is present, the bigger the driver. That's showing the integral error being increased there until there's no error at all, obviously. Once the error is gone, then it stops. Okay, so at this point, there's no error, so now the integral amplifier stops having an effect. I was not trying to show you the signals. So that's your steady state error here. Um, this area here is your transient part. This part to the right is your steady state part. Um, and you can see there, eventually the error has gone. So now um, the arm's in exactly the right position, essentially. Okay, I think that's probably enough. Here. That's the end, anyway. Is there any questions about any of that? Yeah? I think it's, it's quite a good way of introducing you to PID control, but it's a wee bit more advanced than what we're doing today, really. Right. Okay, what I'll do is I'll go back to the slides, I think. So we will be covering um, controllers in more detail, but I think it's about week six, five or six, before we get to that stage.
So most of my slides are taken from the book again, so you'll, you'll recognize a lot of the pictures pointed by the book. Okay, so today's just really an introduction. As I said, it's quite easy to say. Not to bother. Um, uh, you already know all that, so we'll skip through that. You already know that too. That's pretty much the same layout as the uh, Blackboard site has in terms of what you're doing. So we're going to, these first few weeks are really just looking at how we model systems mathematically. Then we can then put them into something like Simulink, and you can put different inputs into them and see what happens at the output. You can put different controllers, um, you can add different <coughs> controllers, you can see how they affect the output, do they make it better, do they make it worse, do you get bigger steady state error, do you get more overshoot, do you get less. Obviously the, the aim is to design <coughs> for a specific amount of overshoot and error. Um, and speed of response, um, which is what you'll be doing in your coursework, actually. That's what you'll actually do, is you'll do a controller design for a specific response. Okay, so that's basically what a control system is. Uh, subsystem processes, um, which is sometimes called plants. Uh, and what we're interested in is what's happening here, put different kinds of inputs here. Yeah? And we want the best response we can get. We can put a whole range of different inputs in here. I think the last slide covers that. The most common one is your step, which is what we were showing on the... In fact, no, that was more a ramp. But the most common one is a step, uh, which is a sudden change from one reference point to a different reference point. So in the, in the arm there, it would be from one position to another position very quickly. Uh, then we've also got ramps, which are a sort of tracking change. So... Um, if you wanted something to gradually, I don't know, rotate or something, that would be a ramp type input. And then the third one is a frequency, a sine wave type of input over a swept frequency range. Um, that sort of input would have shown the Tahoma, Tahoma Bridge problem because that was a frequency of the wind um, problem, really. So, so you can put different inputs in depending on what you're trying to find on the output there. And we will look at those as well. Right, so some examples. We've, oh, sorry, we've already looked at most of those. Uh, nice little robot. I've actually seen this guy. I met him at um, Epcot Center in America. It was really cool. He can do everything. He can jump and walk and he can't speak, but he can do lots of things. I think they can get. They can now get robots that will pull your beer for you as well. So they spill a bit. So it's maybe not ideal. But. It's quite impressive. Um, obviously, robots have a huge number of control systems, and they're very precise um, systems there. And as I was saying, this subject is the sort of precursor to artificial intelligence and robotics. It's a very, it's like a, an early course in robotics, really. So we've got two different kinds of, two classes of control systems. Um, we've got the one that want, we want to maintain something even though there's disturbances. So that's something like the temperature control system. You want your room to stay at the same temperature even if someone opens a window, which would be a disturbance. Or if someone switches on all the computers and they're generating heat, you want the room temperature to stay the same. So that's the, an example of the first one, a regulator. And then you've also got the second one, which is your server mechanism where you want to track an input. So I think the example in the book is an antenna system. Um, Tracking. I don't know what it's tracking, but it's tracking something. <laughs> um, an aircraft landing system. <clears throat> and that's a server mechanism. Okay, so that's the example from the book of a uh, antenna tracking system. So this particular picture, can you see that? Is that open loop or closed loop? Do you think? Did you say open loop? Yeah, you answered all my questions, Kevin. I think it's because everyone else doesn't want to be heard on the video. <laughs> yeah, that's open loop. There's no feedback there. What's happening is the guy sets a desired position using this potentiometer. Um, there presumably would be some sort of power amplification, I guess, which isn't shown. And then the, the antenna will rotate to the same angle as what you've set here. But there's no feedback there. So, for instance, if it was really, really windy, um, that antenna would probably wobble around and wouldn't stay in the right place. Or if the motor, for some reason, was running a bit slow, or I don't know, maybe not slow, was, there was some inaccuracy in the motor, you wouldn't be able to tell that that hadn't rotated to the right position. So open loop systems tend to be less common 
because there's not really an inherent accuracy in them. But for things like a toaster, that doesn't really matter. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is your toaster will burn. <laughs> but things like antennas, you would normally want to toast your system. <clears throat> so ideally, we want the system to detect the disturbance and act accordingly. It's not going to do that if it's an open air system. Uh, I think I'll skip through that because the temperature one will be covered. So here's some examples of some quite complex control systems. Uh, you guys who work at Dune Ray probably have seen little robots that are similar to this uh, rover one that was designed to go in and help clean up Three Mile Island quite a long time ago now. I guess they must have used something similar in Japan. In fact, yeah, I was reading they've got quite a lot of robots deployed in Japan and Fukushima to try and find out what went wrong and why it went wrong. And then we've got liquid level control system, which is what we're going to do the experiment on later after this lecture. Um, elevator control, that's quite a common one. Elevators are quite difficult to control. Um, last year, two people did an elevator project, actually. But the complication with elevators is you don't, want them, you don't want them to have any overshoot. They have to precisely stop at the right floor. You don't want any step or gap. So all in all, elevator systems are quite complex control systems. Not just as simple as just go to this floor, move, stop, approximately half the floor. It's a lot more difficult than that. Did they get it vanished? Sorry? Did they get it vanished? No. <laughs> but they're going to, I think. Well, maybe Rory's in Glasgow now, so it's not so easy for them. But... Okay, so uh, we've kind of looked at this already, but there's an example of a step input. So the input is going... Um, the, the, definition of a step is something that changes from one amplitude to another in an infinitely short time. So it's actually a mathematical concept. It's not a real signal. It's not really possible to have something that changes in an infinitely small time. There's always going to be a bit of a delay there. But in the terms of this particular course, a step is something that changes in an infinitely small time. So you can see here it's changing from zero, um, going up to four um, in zero time, essentially, and that zero time. And then this is what the output response is doing. So as I said to you already, this part where it's changing is the transient response. And this part where it's steady is the steady state response. And there are specifications for both. Yeah? And it depends on the system. Some systems, this part might be really important. Other systems, it might be really important that it responds really quickly. Some, it might, both might be important. <clears throat> So what actually happens here is dependent on both the system's own response, but also what sort of input you're putting in. So we've just already mentioned that an open loop system can't compensate for disturbances. So we don't really know that that's actually done what it wants, what we want it to do. Um, this is a typical block diagram, and you're going to be seeing a lot of these. I'm manipulating them as well. So a typical open loop system will be uh, probably an electrical input. Uh, from some kind of computer or something like that. Um, then a transducer, possibly, um, if your controller is not electric, some kind of transducer to convert the electrical signal to the right physical signal. Um, your controller, which will do the comparison of the two signals, um, and then output a, sorry, not comparison, the controller will um, interpret the input and generate something suitable to drive the output. And then you could have, these things are called summing junctions. You can see there's two plus signs there to show that this disturbance is adding. So this disturbance is something we don't want to happen, like opening a window in a temperature control room. Um, this is the thing you're trying to control, called the process or plant. And you could have another disturbance even outside of that as well. And what you actually get out is way over here. So that's a typical block diagram. We use them quite a lot. That's probably a more useful one. That's a form of feedback. So closed loop system, this is more typical. So again, we may have this input transducer. We may not. Depends on what the signal is here. The key thing is the two signals here at the summing junction have to be the same type. So they have to be either, say, their temperature. They have to both be temperature. If they're electrical, they have to both be electrical. Um, this time, we've got negative feedback. So that's shown by that little minus sign there. Um, and I did say all feedback had to be min negative. Uh, for a stable system. So this time the controller will have an error amplifier as well, where it will compare, if 
amplifier, that's the air amplifier, but that's normally part of the controller. Again, we've got our disturbances on plant. Um, the difference is here, we're feeding back the signal through another transducer. Um, this trans these transducers are normally called sensors. Um, the one that actuates that's called an actuator, but all, all are transducers. Should have come across those terms before, I think. Okay. So when we come to doing the more mathematical side of it, we normally give this a symbol R to stand for reference, and this a symbol C to stand for controlled variable. Okay. You'll see that as well later on. I don't think we're going to do that today. So there's some uh, reasons why we use closed loop control. I think they're pretty obvious. More accurate. Uh, you can control it better. But obviously, as soon as you put feedback in, you're adding expense. Mm. <clears throat> and feedback sometimes quite tricky to handle as well. When I worked in the radar industry, my very first job was to code for an encoder. So we had a rotating system, and then we had feedback via a thing called an encoder, which is like a, it's a rotational sensor, but it produces a digital output. Okay, it's just like a little disc with lots of little holes in it, to be honest, and a light shines through them and produces an output which is proportional to position and speed. So my boss had put it on back to front, so we were getting like really random codes. It had to go on a particular way. We are getting really random codes out, and it took us weeks to figure out what was going on, because I was brand new and I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and he didn't realise he put it on the wrong way. So <laughs> eventually I said, I'm not pretty sure that encoder has been put on the wrong way, and he was really annoyed at me, he's like, there's no way that I've put that on the wrong way. I've, I've been doing this for years, and you're an intern, and how can you possibly tell me this? But it turned out that I was actually right, so it was more a guess than anything else. But. So feedback's not always as straightforward as you might think, that's just a wee story for you. My first ever job. I stayed, <laughs> even though my boss was really bad tempered for a moment. Right, so as I was saying, um, normally when we're designing a controller, we've got a specification we want to meet. Um, we want to meet the transient response, so we maybe want the system to respond quickly. We don't want any overshoot. Uh, we want a specific rise time, a specific peak time. Um, and then we might want a steady state response, which really refers to the steady state error. No steady state error, or can we tolerate a small steady state error? Um, obviously, the system must be stable. So an unstable system is a big problem because that means things like the Tacoma Bridge Narrows occurs, oscillations build up, the system destroys itself. And the actual total response is, a, as I said, is a mixture between um, the natural response of the system and what we're trying to make it do as well. Um, again, that, we'll see that in a more mathematical sense later on. But if this last one, if your natural response doesn't go to zero, then you have an unstable system no matter what input you're putting in. Right. So other considerations, obviously you can't always get the most perfect system because you always have limitations on what you can afford to buy, um, what the capabilities of the hardware are, how accurate is your feedback, for instance. Um, if you had a 50-bit digital to analog converter, you could maybe get a super accurate system, but how realistic is that? Most analog to digital converters, digital analog converters are maybe 20-bit maximum. So there's always limitations that you have to just um, go with. And then there's always things happening in the environment as well, which also affect your design. So, you know, is it in a very high vibration environment? Is it in a very hot climate? Is it a very humid climate? So when you're thinking of design, this applies to everything, not just controllers, obviously. Uh, these are things that come into it. So when you guys are doing your projects, you're doing projects this year, aren't you? Do projects this year. Um, when you're writing your specification, these are things you would probably want to be considering, um, just like with any design, really. Um, that's just the two examples. So we saw the open loop one already. Um, this time we have a closed loop one. So we've got, uh, again, we've got the potentiometer, which is our reference point, telling us what angle we need. Uh, then we've got a difference amplifier here, which happens to also be a power output. Um, so it's going to compare the set point, or the reference point, set by the user with the position via these gears uh, that the antenna is actually at. And another potentiometer here on one of the gears. And that's a closed loop system, obviously, because it's got feedback. I feel like I'm talking a lot and nobody's really asking me anything. Does that mean you don't really understand anything, or is it just a bit boring? 
That's all right. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> so this is the design process that the book goes through. Probably not a bad design process to follow for any design you're doing. Um, first of all, write a specification. Never do a design without an agreed specification because your customer will come along to you and say, oh, I didn't ask for that. <laughs> Why did you design that? <laughs> oh, that's not what I wanted. So make sure you have an agreed specification. Um, in your case, when you're doing projects with me, an agreed brief, yeah, before you actually start doing any real work on your system at all. And then sometimes it's a good idea to draw a block diagram. Um, in the software design world, that would be like something like a flowchart. Then we could have a more detailed schematic which shows what is in each of the blocks. Not necessarily a full design, but kind of the building blocks. So, for instance, you might have a block diagram that says you need feedback, and then you might say, well, my feedback's probably going to be a potentiometer. So that would go into the schematic. Um, right, then this bit applies really to control systems. So here we'll be getting a mathematical block diagram, which you can then put on simulate. Um, we won't be doing this much because you won't have a lot of very large multiple blocks. And then, of course, the last thing you want to do, if you're doing modeling at all, design at all, you need to test that your design works, your model works, and check the specifications in there. So I think that's quite a good design, or design steps to follow. Okay, so this is some examples of, the, of a design process. So... Um, Here's our specification. This is more a brief, because I would expect a specification to have actual numbers and details. Um, a customer's brief is maybe going to say, I want the antenna to be able to rotate at this speed to this position. And then when you write your specification, you say, well, yeah, we can make it go between this speed and that speed, and we can get a position accuracy of between this, this and this. Um, but anyway, so they've called it a specification, but I would say that's probably more a brief but it's covering how you're going to position it, what the weight of the thing is, and what the physical dimensions of it are. And then what we're trying to achieve, how fast we want it to rotate, and what accuracy it needs to achieve once it stops. Um, then that's our basic block diagram. It's a little bit difficult to see, I guess, for you guys, but um, we've got our input transducer, our error amplifier, our controller, our actuator, which is the motor, to rotate the thing. And then we're measuring the angular output. So that's measuring the position, feeding it back through another um, sensor, which in this case is a potentiometer, comparing the two. And then that will just keep adjusting. The controller will just keep adjusting until there's no error. Yeah. So that's what you probably want to achieve anyway, or the error you specify. OK, that's the difference between a block diagram and a schematic diagram. Not really a huge difference. But here we've defined what we're actually going to be using in the blocks to some extent. Not in huge detail, but you know, knowing we're going to use a power amp and a differential amp. Um, we're going to use a motor as the actuator. Yeah, a gear and a potentiometer as our feedback mechanism. Okay. Uh, that's very similar to the previous block diagram. I'm not very sure why that's there. And then the final thing we want to do is obviously model it. Now, your models are all going to be based on first principles. Um, it might not seem like that when we get into the maths. It's quite tricky maths, but they're all based on your first principles. Kirchhoff's voltage law, which is the sum of voltages around a loop is zero. EMFs equals potential drops. I think everybody should know that. Mechanical people should have done that as well. Um, we've got Kirchhoff's current laws. We've got some algebraic sum of currents going into a junction is zero. Um, then we've got Newton's laws, which are forces on a body, um, a stationary body, are always zero as well. Um, and the same is true for moments. It's kind of the same idea. Okay. And then this is what we would end up putting in simulate. So similar to what you did in engineering analysis. Um, a mathematical description of your system, and then we can add, we can apply inputs and, out, and look at the outputs. Now, the commonest forms of inputs... Oh, I thought we were going to see that now. Oh, no, it must be the next slide. Um, so this is with a step applied, um, looking at the effect of change of the proportional gain. That's the advantage of modelling. Changing gain is just a matter of typing in a number. If you had to build that, you'd have to change resistors in your amplifier or maybe even replace the amplifier. So it's far easier to do with a computer. 
uh, so powerful now you can do the entire design and be reasonably confident that it will work. So two differences there. I don't know, can you read these? No. Okay, do you want to tell me which is the high gain one and which is the low gain one? Do you think this is high or low gain? High. High, yeah. Good. Okay, and that's low gain. Taking a long time. So this would be what we'd call, do you remember what the responses are called? In terms of damping? Underdamped. That one would be underdamped, yeah, good. So there's too much energy in the system, it's overshooting and it's taking a while before the energy's been removed, so that's called underdamped, it's not got enough damping. Um, the second one's obviously overdamped, um, not enough energy to get the system to respond quickly enough. And then you also get critical damping, which is your ideal situation, where it will come up nice and fast and settle really quickly. Right, good. Some people do remember some stuff from last year or two years ago. These are your inputs. It's a bit difficult to see them here. Uh, you can look at the slide later yourself. Um, we won't really be doing much with an impulse. An impulse is, again, a mathematical signal, really. Um, it's an infinitely large uh, signal that is infinitely short. So that's a bit odd. But it basically just looks like an arrow on your y-axis there. Um, step I've already explained, ramps, self-explanatory. And then we won't be doing too much with parabolas, but sometimes you might be interested in how does your system respond to an input that does something like that. Um, and then later on, towards the end of the control theory part, we'll look at sinusoidal inputs. So that's looking at sweat frequencies, sine waves. And that's the last of those slides. Okay, uh, are we doing for time? Ten. Early. What I wanted to do with you is a wee bit of maths now, I think. So, I'm going to find my sheet. Has anybody got any questions? No? Uh, right. I'm not going to be talking for the full two hours, and that's probably true every week. <coughs> I don't know what you're used to with you guys who had Pete last year, whether he talks for the full two hours or not. But two hours is far too long for somebody to just talk constantly. What I want to do is do a wee bit of maths with you on, first of all, fractions, because strangely enough, people are not very great at fractions. So, I'll just give you some questions to do, and we'll see how you get on. <coughs> We're going to be using fractions a lot because... Um, ultimately, the thing that goes in the box in your MATLAB or simulink uh, model is a transfer function. It's called a transfer function. I'll quite often label that as a TF. So if I use TF, you'll know what I'm talking about in terms of abbreviations. Um, and what that actually is, is output. Okay, so they're not necessarily numbers. They could be like different types of input steps or ramps and things. But if that's the model, will show you how your output varies for every different kind of input. That's what, so we're going to come into fractions quite a lot because you can see that that's potentially a fraction. Yet, yeah. okay. Do you want to give me the answer to this first one? Maybe I'll ask a specific person. Do you want to just all, all have a go at doing it if you don't already? I just randomly asked somebody to be able to tell me. It's really easy, but I just want you to get used to doing stuff with fractions. It's a while since we've got done this. Let's see next to you, Evelyn. 0.857. Sorry? 0 0.857. Yeah. Oh, um, can you do it with fractions rather than... Decimals, so that means not using a calculator. Or well, you can use a calculator for multiplications, but I want a fraction answer if possible. Okay, well, I just write the answer. Let's see if you get it right. So I would say that's any given. If I get this wrong, tell me. 24, which is six seven. Okay, did anybody know how to do that? So the way I did that was I did three quarters, because you have the numerator, 
There is a reason I'm doing this. We're going to be using S squared algebra. It's not just going to be easy numbers like this. And then because that's on the denominator, um, to divide by a fraction, you flip it upside down and multiply. I don't know if everybody knew that or not. Okay. So that's the way that works. Yeah. Does everybody know that already? It's too easy. Okay, just, I don't want you to think you're doing stupid stuff. But. Okay, so how is there's a, there's, that's now a, a algebraic equation rather than, so A, B, C, and D are variables, yeah? Which is why we use algebra in case anybody's not sure of it. The reason we use letters is because they don't represent a specific number, they represent a range of numbers. Yeah. So if you're not very sure of this stuff, um, you can try that in and out cycle and get up. So I wanted to do that. Now, uh, what's going to be more common? You don't want to go too fast. But the sort of things you're going to be seeing are things like um, first order systems, second order systems. The standard equation for a first order system is something like this. Right. Now, we want to be able to put that into MATLAB. Well, in fact, there's a few reasons why you might want to be able to rearrange that. Um, what I want maybe to do is to rearrange that so that the S is by itself. So do you want to have a go at trying to do that for me? Um, K, by the way, K is gain and T is time constant. We'll come to that later, but that's a standard first order system. So we want to rearrange that so the S is by itself. I'll give you a bit longer to do that. I think I was rushing a bit. This will be easy for you then. Yeah? You've got pen with you. Okay, so how do I do that? How do I get the S by itself? What do I need to do to everything? What do I need to do to get the S by itself? I'm sure you've all done it. You just don't want to speak to me for some reason. That was wrong. <laughs> Divide everything by T? Yeah, because if you did T over T, what does that give you? Divided by T is? Oh, yeah, so that would get rid of the T part here, wouldn't it? Yeah, I divide T by T, it gets rid of the T. So you end up with K divided by T over S plus 1 divided by T. Yeah, is that what everybody got? No, it doesn't matter if you didn't, you should get it now. <laughs> I'm trying to think what else would that be likely to do. Uh, okay, so transfer functions work like fractions. Um, you can multiply them the same way, you can divide them the same way. So if I have two blocks with... I'll, I'll do it with numbers first, just to make it a little bit easier. And maybe that's my first transfer function, and then... So that might be my controller. Maybe this is my actuator. I'm just making these up. That, that's a fairly standard format. You will see that quite a lot. Never mind about what the S is just now. I'll come to them later. They're to do with uh, Laplace transforms. Some of you will have seen already. Um, so if I wanted to convert that all into one block, I want to multiply the two together. So do you want to try and do that for me? 
your input, that's your output. I know this seems like simple maths, but I just want to make sure that everybody's kind of basic understanding before we go into more complex stuff next week or whenever we do. I'm never very sure how long to give you for these. I mean, give me enough time. Whatever time. <laughs> Till the end of the lecture. You do a few break. Okay. Do one of the Stevens want to give me the answer first? Deliberately not looking at me. Anyone want to give any answer? Um, I forgot the order. Hmm? I forgot the order. I don't know. I forgot the start. You don't know where to start? No, it's usually start the You multiply the numerators and you multiply the denominators. Sure. Right, okay, so 5 times 2 is? 12. 5 times 2 is 10. That's your numerator, okay? Um, I was going to do it a bit quicker, but since people say they're struggling, I'll, I'll split it into more. S plus 3 times S plus 2, and then you guys sometimes learn to boil at school, which admittedly was a long time ago. S times S gives you S squared, plus 3 times S gives you 3S, plus 2 times S gives you 2S, plus 3 times 2 is 6. Yeah, I'll do it over here. It's not following a standard maths. <laughs> Okay. So I think that just proves that it was worth doing this. I thought this was too easy, but obviously it's not. Okay. I got it. Yeah. That, by the way, looks a bit like a second order transfer function. We'll get to that later. But that's the ones with two energy storage elements. They come out like that. Okay. Um, so you can make up some examples for yourselves, I suppose, and compare them with each other or have a look at some maths papers. The other thing I wanted to show you was um, a bit about matrices. I've got some notes on that, though, which is probably a bit easier. Anybody really any questions about that? You understand that now that you've seen it, yeah? You're going to be doing a lot of this. That's why I said it was quite mathematical, but it is just algebra. It's not really... Not as bad as like maths two or whatever. Okay, have you finished copying that? A bit more time. Everybody all right? Yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to show you was the bit on matrices. Probably won't do the whole thing. Actually, let's switch back to this for a minute. Uh, in fact, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to do the mesh network analysis. It's a bit more complicated, but it shows the use of matrices better, I think. So, you think I should just to skip to that? So, we've got a little circuit here, and I've already told you that, um, I don't know if I can write them that, hopefully I can. Kirchhoff's voltage law tells you the sum of EMFs is the same as the sum of voltages. Uh, Potential drops. So let's scroll down a minute. I might not actually need to write yet. I can just show you the diagram. So we want to analyze the circuit to find out what the volts drops across the resistance are. Yeah, we've got a DC voltage here, 12 volts, 6 volts there. I don't know what sort of circuit it is, could be anything. And then some values of resistors, just plain resistors. Um, you could do this with uh, impedances as well. 
Um, I'm not sure if the mechanical people might not have done much work with impedances, but they're just like resistors with complex number values for capacitors and ductive elements. But anyway, so uh, well, he's done it a different way. Right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do that a different way myself. So a bit complicated. Really, so. Am I going to remember what that circuit was? Probably not. <laughs> Anybody be able to tell me what the values were? It doesn't really matter. You can do it at different times. That was 12, wasn't it? And there was a resistor there. A resistor here. So this isn't really a circuit theory class. This is just an example of our matrices. Um, so I'll, I'll run through the actual circuit analysis quite quickly because you're not really going to need to be able to do this in too much detail. But what we do is we pick a current value for our current direction and value for each loop. Yeah, and then we just basically relate the volts drops across each resistor to the currents and the voltages. Um, some of you have done this before. So we'll have a volts drop across there, and we'll have a volts drop across there. That's across that resistor. They're always in the opposite direction of the current. So if the current's going down that way, the volts drops are in the opposite way. Um, in this side, the current's going that way, so this volts drop's going to be that way. Um, it's been that way, and that one's going to be that way because they always oppose the current. And we've just arbitrarily picked currents. If we get it wrong, we'll get a negative number. Um, you guys will have done this with forces, I think, something quite similar. And yeah. the simultaneous equations and things. Right, so if we pick, we've just gone through that. In fact, I might just switch back over to the <laughs> slides. But um, we've got our EMF for our first loop is 12 volts. Um, that is the right direction because that's the plus, that's the minus, so that is producing that current in that direction, so that, we can leave that as it is. And that's going to be equal to the sum of drops around the loop, which in this case is V1 plus V2. Um, and if we relate them to currents, that's I1 times your 2 ohms, plus the current going through this resistor is I1 going down the way, I2 coming back. So... Times three, which is the the ohms. So that's just V equals I R. Ohms law. And if you do the same with the second loop, um, this time that's the negative end. So the current's coming out the negative end. So actually on this side that will have to be negative. Like I said, don't worry too much about the intricacies of this because we're not going to be doing a lot of it. Um, but V3 plus V4, so again, current going through the, um, the, res the forum resistor is I2, so we could just write that as I2 times 4, and then the current going through, well, the thing causing V4 drop is the current going through the flip 3 on resistor, which is I2 minus I1, and it's that 3 ohm resistor. Okay, then we can rearrange those to get simultaneous equations. Some people are actually writing this. I'll give you a few seconds to finish writing it. If you please to get this probably the last thing I'm going to do today, so apart from showing you that, we can do that after break, though. So we need to be on the recording. So the plan is everything's recorded, so actually you don't really need to write stuff down unless you really want to. But sometimes the recordings don't work, so it might not be a bad idea. But students in the past have said the recordings are quite good for revision anyway. 
Okay, so if I scroll down a wee bit. If we rearrange that as simultaneous equations, we're going to have, I'll put them on this side, we're going to have 2i1 plus 3i1, so that's 5i1. I'll probably get this wrong now, but um, minus 3i2 equals 12. And then for the second group, we've got minus 3i1. Four I two, seven I two. Tell me if I get it wrong, by the way. Do what I'm doing. Okay, so we end up with two equations like that. Now you all know how to solve simultaneous equations. You could work out the values of I one and I two. But what I really wanted to show you was why we use matrices for this sort of thing. Um, we'll do a bit more on matrices, I think, possibly next week too, because we're doing quite a long time. So if we were to do this in matrices, what we can do is we can take out the constant parts of that as a single matrix, um, call it A, and then the variables as another matrix B. Have you you've done matrices? Did everybody say they've done matrices? No, some people haven't. And then have a, a third matrix C, which is our answer matrix. So it would look a bit like... Minus three, three, seven. Okay. Uh, so a bit of information about that's what that two simultaneous equations would look like in matrix form. Matrices are identified by square brackets. Um, they have rows and they have columns. If you want to identify a single element in a matrix, you identify it by the row number and the column number. Okay, so for instance, if we wanted um, element A12 of this first matrix, we'll call that first matrix A, that one's B, that one's C. Anyone want to take a guess as to what element A12 would be? Three. Three. So first row, second column. Yeah. So that's the first thing, um, and you can do that for any size of matrix. You know, if it's got 50 rows, A, 25, 7 will be the 25th row, the 7th element, 7 column. Okay, so it's row. Um, that is quite useful because MATLAB uses matrices all the time, and you might end up with a matrix answer, and you might want just a specific part of that. So you could get the specific part by using the element ID. Right, multiplication of matrices. Um, they have to have, um, the one on the left has to have the same number of elements in the row as the one you're multiplying by has in its column. Okay, and the way it works, um, you can see that the first equation was 5i1 minus 3i2. Oh, have I done that wrong? Sorry, that should have been minus 3. I don't think. That was wrong. That should be minus three. And this should be plus three. Oh, that's minus three as well. Okay, I just missed the minus there. Yeah, that's right now. Okay, so these two elements relate to... That was a bit bad planning because we ended up with two elements the same. These two elements relate to these two bits, yeah? And these two relate to those two. And that was a bad equation because it ended up with two minus threes, which is not great. Um, the way it works is um, you multiply the row by the column. So for the first row, you would have 5 times I1 minus 3 times I2, which is indeed what we have here. Yeah? So I think people who haven't done this before will have to look up a maths, because you know, this is obviously a very condensed course. Yeah? <laughs> and then for the second equation, um, it's row times column, so minus 3 times I1 plus 7 times I2. Right, that's all very well for really short matrices um, doesn't really show you how to do the solving. You can do the solving. Um, the way you would do that would be you take the inverse of that one and multiply it by that. But I want to show you it with a bigger matrix. Thanks. <laughs> a bit of a condensed course in matrices, but never mind. Um, so, okay, anybody still writing? No? Okay, so here is a bigger matrix. Uh, 
Uh, well, that's for that same circuit, but never mind. He's done it a different way. So we ended up with a bigger matrix here. Um, and what we're going to do, uh, we can solve this by a method called Kramer's rule. So uh, I need to explain about determinants first. Um, the way you find determinants, again, you're going to have to look at my last book, I think, because I can't really teach you in one class how to do this properly, um, is you take any one row and you cross that row out, so basically not looking at it, and then you look at each element individually. If I can write on this, I'd be to show you a little bit. So, um, to get the determinant of just this matrix here, um, I'll do it the same way he's done it. He is using... He hasn't done it most of the time. Oh, here, yeah, okay. I'm just going to check which row he's used. He's used the top row. Okay, so these numbers here, hopefully I can write on this. No, I can't. Hold on a second, I'm just going to sort the board so I can write to me. So I have to close it first to get that. I think it did. It's not going to be very good. We'll see. Okay, so he's done as he's used. Yeah, it hasn't made any. Oh, <laughs> oh wait. Right. Um, I'll have to just explain it without being able to write on it, unfortunately. But he's used the top row. So this number one, that minus one, and that minus one are related to the top row. Um, there is a thing of cofactors. We really need to be able to draw this. Uh, and download it. Can you just take a screenshot? Cut. Please. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> well, I'll do it. I'll extend the page. Depending on which row you take, I'm not going to bother calling them cofactors. Depending on which row you take, you also have to take a sign change um, of that form. So if you take, for those people who haven't really done much on matrices, if you always pick the top row, um, your middle element's always going to change its sign. Okay, that makes, that's easier to explain that, that one. We're going back to what we had. So these numbers here, that one, that minus one, and that minus one are coming from the top row, but the middle one's got sign change because of that cofactor matrix I just showed you. And then the bits in the brackets are found by covering up the top row and the elements. So, for instance, this first one here, what we've done is covered up those two and then multiplied 0 times minus 4. So it's always in that direction first. 0 times minus 4, minus 4 times minus 3. I think if I could show that. One more, minus 1. I'm never going to remember that. 1 more, minus 1, 2, 0, 4, 0, minus 3, minus 3. Anybody written down the matrix? Can you tell me what it was? No. One, one, one minus one. Anybody remember the next row? Zero, four, last Zero. Two, zero, four. Two, zero, four, zero, four. Two, zero, four, zero, minus three, four. I think that was it. Okay, if that's wrong, never mind. You can just watch what I'm doing anyway. So we're using the top row. So the first thing we're going to do is take that first one there. Right, and we're going to multiply that by uh, these, these four, yeah? So it's zero um, times four. And then you subtract the opposite, the diagonal, so it's minus 4 times minus 3. Right, then we're going to take the second element, um, but make it negative because of that cofactor thing I showed you. Plus, minus, plus, plus. Oh, wrong. Minus, plus, minus, plus. 
Okay, so that's where the minus signs come from. And this time we're going to put it down a different colour. Let's do that a different colour. So this time we're going to cover up that row and that, sorry, that row and that column. So we're left with two times four minus uh, that row, that column, two times four minus four times zero. Are you following this okay? You two that haven't done matrices. In fact, there's probably a few people who haven't, I suspect. And then we can do the final row. Here's the minus one here. I'm covering up that row and that column leaves us with two times minus three minus uh, zero times zero, which is obviously zero. Okay, so that's the way you get a determinant. This whole thing is just for working out the determinant. I haven't really showed you why you need that yet. You'll find that in a minute. It's an easy way of solving complicated simultaneous equations, essentially. Some folk are writing that. I'll give you some space to do that. Okay, so. And when you're doing multiplying, it's always left, top, bottom, right. Minus, um, bottom, left, top, right. It's always that order. Uh, we won't really be looking at anything larger than three by three ones. If you get larger than three by three, you get MATLAB to do it for you, because they get difficult then. Okay, everybody finished copying that needs to? Yeah. So if we go back to the example, I'll just show you how they're going to use these determinants to solve the simultaneous equations. So by solve the simultaneous equations, I mean find the values of currents um, in those equations. So, okay, so that's fine. That's the, that was the determinant of this matrix. It might not have been the exact matrix, because I didn't copy it, but hopefully that's the determinant of that matrix. Then you can solve for each of the currents by replacing um, the answers here with the current that you're trying to... So for I1, you would replace this first column with this answers or with these voltages. So you can see here, instead of having 1, 2, 0, we have 0, 12, minus 6, which were the numbers in this column. And then you do the same again, you find the determinant of that. So again, taking the top row, 0, 1, minus 1, that's the 0 there, that's the minus 1, change sign because of the cofactor, and that's the minus 1 from there. And then cross, crossing across gives us these numbers. Um, obviously, zero, there's no point mark working anything else out because that's gone. Uh, minus one, we're going to have 12 times minus four, minus four times minus six, which is that bit. And then the other one, um, using this column now, so it's going to be 12 times minus three, minus zero times minus six, which gives us these two numbers. Okay, follow that, okay? That's just finding a determinant of a different matrix. So you do that for each. Um, column. So you start with the first one and then you go back to the original values in the first one and replace the second column with the, the right hand side matrix and then you do the same for the third column and then once you've got all those determinants you can find your, solve your simultaneous equations by dividing, for I1, dividing that number by uh, this number and for I2, it'll be that number by that number. And for I3, it's this number by that number. So it's actually quite easy. And the notes are there for you to have a look at yourself and read through. But that, that's a really easy way of solving quite difficult simultaneous equations. And it's one of the reasons we use matrices. The other reason is almost all your modeling tools defer matrices, defer everything else as well. Um, OK, I think that's pretty much all I was going to do with you today. Apart from, as I say, I want to show you the rig. Is anybody leaving at 11? Or are you all staying for the full I'll leave at 12 first. 12, 12 will be fine. That will still give me time to do with this. I'll probably do it at 11. Right, you might need to see a video of this then. Oh, unless I might have time. We might, I can do it before you go for a break then. Mm -hmm. So that Barry can see it as well. I'll do it quite quickly. The, stuff, the data is already on. Right, so that's all in terms of today's lecture. I did want to quickly show you the coursework just to explain why we're doing the experiment. So there will be 
um, assignments for this week. They come from the book, but I've copied them this week for you. So you can go in there and you can answer the questions. Um, I'm sorry, that's the solutions. Only ever do the questions I've asked. Don't do any additional questions, because uh, there are some really complex examples in the book, and I don't want you to get too bogged down. We're trying to do ones that are way beyond what you need to know. Right, in terms of the courseworks, today's one, or the one I'm going to show you just now, so we already did this experiment a couple of years ago, and I already took data, so I'm not going to record any data today. But what, what the idea of the coursework is, is to um, do a level control controller. So what we're going to do is, um, with the Vitronic rig there, we've got a bottom sump tank, we've got a pump, and we've got some various flow sensors and things, which we're not really too interested in. Uh, but we pump the water up from the bottom tank to the top tank, and the idea is to control the level in a closed loop system with a controller. What I'm going to show you is the open loop system and the response you get from an open loop system. And then the coursework requires you to take that open loop system, model the system mathematically using the data that I've um, measured. So that's showing output versus input. Um, there's some guidelines which I'll go into later on how to do that. It requires MATLAB. Um, and then adding a controller to that, a, a simple PID controller, tweaking that controller to get the best possible response. So no overshoot, no error, fast, as fast as possible. Obviously, it's a flow control, a level control, so it's quite slow, but a reasonably fast response. And that's your first coursework, essentially, <coughs> doing that. So just to show you the system, I thought I'd actually do it for real rather than just like, show you a video. Click on there. I'll zoom in a bit as well. <coughs> okay, so the submission dates are there as well, so no, no excuse for being late. Um, there's no word count in this because it's quite a mathematical um, crossword. So, and you see what you have? 27th of October is the first one. Okay. But the sooner you get working on it, the better. So the first bit, I'm going to actually give you the data. So you don't, you're not actually doing the first bit. You're obtaining the set response. So what I'm doing is asking the level to change from one level to another immediately, and then recording the data in terms of how the level changes when you do that. So we're going to get that. Um, then from there on is your requirement. You'll need to draw a block diagram. So I don't know if you want to take some photos. There'll be stuff on DLE about the Vitronic anyway. Um, then modeling it. I'll obviously go into more detail later. And then testing that you've modeled it correctly, because obviously there's no point designing a controller if your model isn't right to start with. Designing your controller, tuning your controller. Um, I've got a wee note there that there is a tune button in Simulink. I don't want you doing that, because that doesn't really teach you anything. Testing that. Um, and then there's a bit about frequency response, which will be quite a bit later. Okay, so uh, I guess that's really the end of the lecture for today, and I'll just set up the rig to show you the rig working, and you can play with the rig yourselves if you want to as well. Um, for the folk who are listening in or watching the video, um, I'll do a recording of that later on today. So I'm glad you, Robbie. Hmm? No, Ross, yeah. Robbie, yeah. Robbie there. No, no. Yeah. He, he will be watching. There's a couple of other remote guys as well. Is that a sheep cell? Okay, is everybody okay? Oh, there is somebody there. Is everybody happy? Um, is there anything you want me to change about the format of the lecture, or are you reasonably okay with this? Yeah? Okay. And obviously, at any time, you can tell me that you don't like want me talking for two hours. You'd rather do more work yourselves in the two hours. Or whatever. But you've got another two hours now to, to really do some work. So uh, This week probably will be a bit of a waste of time, but future weeks you'll be pretty busy, I think, in the two hours after. Uh, I'll just stop the recording now, then, um, if everyone's okay with that. I'll see everybody next week, hopefully. Bye for now, then. Bye. Right. Exit. Thank <laughs> you.
This call has been disconnected. Thank you for joining.